Good morning. Keith Livingston here with Healthy Intelligent Training. This morning I'm interviewing Lorraine Moller, a great Kiwi running legend. She's based in Boulder, Colorado right now. So, Lorraine? Yes, Keith. It's Lorraine. afternoon here. So, good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. And yeah, of course, it's afternoon your time, 3 p.m. So, you had a, a late start today. You went for a swim. Yes. You know, I swim in the outdoor heated pool and it's pretty damn cold here. It's surrounded by snow and ice. So pretty fun. Yeah, so you, you don't run around the edge of the pool then? No, it's a little bit uh, precarious uh, running out there. Yeah. What prompted you to start running in the first place? And, and just tell us about your early days. Um, and I'll just listen. Well, yeah, Keith, I don't know how far back you want to go. As far back as you can um, remember. I was, I was involved in the, the New Zealand culture of uh, athletic clubs for little kids. So that was just an actual part of my life. Um, and we were back then, and I hope it's that way still, but uh, I think changing somewhat. Um, yeah. Outdoors culture. So, you know, the mum that picked you out the door and said, sun shining, you're not allowed to be inside. You know, there was just movement, a lot of movement. And uh, that's what kids did. So we're out exploring and very involved with the environment. So uh, that's just as setting a scene, which I was not the fastest sprinter. So... You know, I'd get in there and I had this long, lopey stride and, of course, 60 uh, yards or 100 yards dash. I, I never finished first. Um, I would finish second, third, something like that. Um, and, and I loved it and I was very competitive. So when I went to high school, I was 13 years old and... So once I was a high schooler, I graduated to senior athletics at our local club, Taro Athletic Club. And that was on a Wednesday night. And that meant that we then were uh, introduced to all these other races. So um, the first night there, I went in the 440 yards. And with my long, lopey stride, I ran around that track and I beat the girls who beat me in the sprints. And that was when I discovered my calling. Um, I was a distance runner over 440 yards, cross track, bare feet. Uh, but, you know, that feeling of winning was exhilarating for me. Uh, then that evolved into doing 880 yards. Anything from 440 yards on, I won. I just beat everybody, and I beat them by a long way, and I clearly had a talent for it. Uh, at our um, school champs, I think I won just about everything and uh, set records and everything and went on to the intersecondary school champs, and it just started building on itself. Uh, at 14 years old, they had the Waikato Intersecondary School Championships. So that was sort of the pinnacle of competing at my age. And my event was the 80 yards. Um, I was pretty naive, um, fairly untrained. Um, anyway... I went in this race and uh, I was warming up and I saw a girl there who was doing exercises and I thought, gee, she must be good. She had a tracksuit on and uh, she had her striped shoes. And I'm in bare feet in my rompers, no tracksuit, you know, just sort of doing a little jog around looking to see what everybody rompers. else was doing. But my rompers, yeah. Rompers. rompers. Oh, I'm yeah. about rompers. <laughs> Gosh, they were daggy, weren't they? <laughs> Regulation issue for girls, yes. Oh. <laughs> I know, that dates us. And my top, which was very heavy cotton, which I sewed myself. I, I got in this race with this, this girl, and we're running around first lap, and the second lap she takes off. 
and uh, my aunt, her, who was living with us at the time, had said that if I won the race, she would knit me this, uh, it was um, sort of the rage at the time was these sort of crocheted dresses, but they were done on big knitting needles and um, and I really wanted one of these dresses. And she said, if I won the race, she'd knit me one. And so this girl takes off and she's zooming down the finishing straight. And I think to myself, I'm not gonna get my dress. So I put on the afternoons and uh, with my dress in mind, I asked her and won the race and got my dress. So, you know, so uh, bribery was, you know, a really good motivator for me. Uh, but the thing was that I did have a good finish. You know, even though I wasn't the fastest sprinter, I, I could really finish a race well. And that sort of became my signature. And um, so then I graduated onto, oh, well, actually after that race, uh, and I won it and I'm 14 years old and a, a man came up to me after the race and he was very official. So the New Zealand had all these administrators, which were men in blazers who were, generally um, sort of, yeah, uh, civil servants who did this volunteer on the weekend, but they're always very official looking. And um, so a man in a blazer came up to me and said, uh, you should run cross country. And I had no idea even really what cross country was about. And, uh, and I went, okay. Um, if he thinks I should run cross country, then I probably should. And so I signed up to run cross country races. And uh, my first race was a mile over these farmlands. So, you know, pretty rugged country that, um, you know, sheep ruts and, you know, high grass and mud and fences. And, and I won it. But I didn't have any training much, and um, so it was pretty tough doing a whole mile. Uh, the next week, I ran in a senior woman's race because there was no junior woman category in this particular event, and it was at the in the farms behind um, in Para, just on the outskirts. And uh, in this race was Pam Kenny and Val Robinson. And they were the international athletes and tough seasoned women competitors. And so I got in this race. Now Val Robinson was uh, the unofficial world champion uh, in the cross country. So she had gone away on her own ticket to international cross country events where she ran unofficially because there was no official women's championship at that time. So uh, she she took off and I'm running alongside Pam Penny and I'm stuck to her. I'm stuck to her side. And Pam, we're running along, and I must have been puffing really hard. I think it was a two-mile event, so twice what I'd ever run before. And I'm puffing so much, Pam says to me, I think you should slow down, Lorraine. I think you should slow down. And I thought to myself, oh, she doesn't want me to beat her. <laughs> So there was no way I was slowing down. So I, I stuck to her more tenaciously than ever. And we came down to the home stretch. And my legs had gone completely numb from the knees down. And my uh, sight was sort of telescoping. And, uh, and I went, okay, I can't feel my legs, so I might as well move them as fast as I can because they're not going to hurt anyway. So I just sort of pumped them up and down like as fast as I could. And as I remember it, I, I put uh, Pam on the finish line and, um, and collapsed at the end. So I'm lying on the ground and I'm gasping. I'm like a fish out of water. And uh, my dad 
comes along and he's sort of embarrassed and he picks me up and he tries to get me to move and um, you know like that's really poor form to be collecting at the end of the race and uh, so he piles me in the car and he takes me home and uh, my dad's uh, he's, his remedy for most things was a hot bath so he runs the bath for me and he says, okay, you get in the bath. And, um, and he got in the car and took off back to the, uh, the pub rooms where everyone was having their, you know, cup of tea and their pikelets with cream and, you know, scones that the ladies had made them. And they would have the price giving. And so I'm sitting in the bath and I'm starting to feel better. It's a good remedy, yes. And uh, so then... I jump out of the bath, put my clothes back on, my running clothes, um, run up the back way. So you had to cross a railway line, so my dad and the car had to go the long way, but I took the shortcut across the railway line. I got to the clubhouse, and by the time he arrived, I was there getting my award. And my father said, that's when I knew she was going to be a champion. <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> they decided uh, that if I was going to race like that, I had to train. So they gave John Davies, who lived in the neighbouring town. Now, John Davies was the Olympic bronze medalist, uh, protege of Arthur Lydiards, and he lived 50 miles away. So uh, the club captain, they called them up and um, arranged for us to meet and for him to take me under his wing and train me. And so that's when I got my first uh, training program. And uh, the first thing John did in being a Lydia protege uh, got me to build up my miles. And so I can remember after a few weeks, I ran 40 miles. Estimated 40 miles. I mean, uh, maybe I ran 35, but uh, what we did was, you know, you ran for 42 minutes and you divided it by seven and that gave you six miles. So it was just an estimate. But anyway, I remember when I got the 40 miles and I did a big circle around it and that seemed like phenomenal. And uh, my dad started running with me. So my dad at that stage was not a runner. He uh, was an ex-serviceman. Uh, He'd been in the Navy from really young. He'd come back. I think he probably had some PTSD. Uh, he liked to go to the pub and drink and fight. Um, and he decided that if he, he would run with me to keep me company. And... Uh, it was an opportunity for him to uh, get rid of his beer gut and uh, get fit. And he loved it. He, he got into it. And the, the pair of us would go running and we got into longer and longer runs. And we started taking the car and we'd drive a couple of miles out of town. So we had a big uh, forest around. We find our forest with all these logging tracks. And uh, so we would park out by the forest and just run for hours and hours and it just built up. Um, a lot of the times we got in long runs only because my dad had a very poor sense of direction and we'd often get lost. Uh, but we had many, many hours and uh, I, I didn't know my dad very well until we started running and that was a wonderful time for he and I to He'd tell me stories and, you know, just sort of, you know, how you get into a stream of consciousness. So you, um, you just uh, develop a rapport. And uh, so we'd go stride for stride. And, you know, if I knew that we were lost and I'd get really upset and so I'd run behind sort of stopping. And, um, but, you know, we always made it back. <laughs> Sometimes we're in the middle of it. start. And we're fumbling along, trying to find our way, and it's glow worms, so it's the only light, you know. But anyway, we made it back each time, and uh, we got fitter. And uh, uh, he'd go in his races, and I'd go in mine. And uh, 
And we always sprinted to the end. We always had a, you know, like you'd see the, the finishing line coming up and then, you know, he'd start taking off and then I'd chase him and, you know, but I could always get him to the finish. So, um, and that, that went for uh, quite a few years. Those were my formative years till uh, at least three years we did. And uh, that gave me an excellent background. And meantime, I was like a, um, winning everything. And I was known as the, the runner around town. And, um, and John Davies had me on this Lydia program, uh, which was very um, conservative because they didn't really know how to coach a girl. Like this was a whole different thing. Um, so he didn't want to ruin me or anything like that. Um, I did have a few problems. Um, there was a period where I got very anemic. Um, and uh, that and that was really just because I, I was going through puberty and got my period, you know. Um, and so that was a, a tremendous um, a hurdle for me to negotiate, which I think is always for a young woman because you, you get all these hormonal changes and then the whole uh, uh, way your body is reacting to things changes and, and you're no longer uh, competitive with the boys. Um, you know, you get left behind. And so but I, I went through it and came out the other side and... Uh, um, and negotiated that one. And the, the sport became the most important thing for me. Uh, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And uh, so then uh, I got to the time where, you know, it was seventh form and I was leaving school and I wanted to be a runner, but, you know, there was no such thing as professional runners and girls didn't run much. And um, uh, but that, that was like, that was my world. And uh, so I couldn't think of really what to do. But Gary, had, my brother, had gone to phys ed school and he liked it. And uh, so I went, okay, well, I'll just follow my brother and I'll go to phys ed school because, you know, that's the closest thing to what sports that I can think of. And so I did. So. My first day at phys ed school. Now, just, um, just tell yeah. us where, where phys ed school was. It was a long way away from Butararu. Yeah, it was. So Butararu's in the middle of the North Island, and the phys ed school is at Otago University, which is near Dunedin, which is quite a way south of the South Island. And uh, I loved it, you know. It was like... I wanted to get as far away from home as I could. I was like, you know, get me out of the influence of my parents. And, you know, I, I, I was just thrilled to be there. And, of course, my brother had a head start and um, there were all these teenage boys and, you know, it was just a wonderful time. Um, so here I am the first week and... I'm standing on the steps of the phys ed school in my shorts and t-shirt and running Not shoes. Rompers. No, I sort of <laughs> grew out of rompers, you know. <laughs> um, though, though they they probably would have been quite acceptable attire, you know. But anyway, um, this group of guys came running by and they they were all running on the um, on the footpath in a in a bunch, and sort of you know quite quite chummy. And one of them looked up and saw me there, and he yelled out, "Hey, check! You're gonna come and run with the boys." And I went, "Okay." So I bounded down the steps of the Z school, and I joined on with the back of these guys, and uh, they were the lunchtime runners. And a lot of them were um, New Zealand representative runners. They were setting a pretty mean pace. Uh, they were probably running, you know, 
is six to six, 30 miles um, up and down these hills around Dunedin. They went for about oh, 45 minutes. Um, and, you know, I tagged on the back of them. And uh, the next day I was there again, and then the next day and the next day. And so um, away it went. And next thing you know, I'm running uh, with these guys just every day. And then I'm joining them on the weekends. Well, Saturday we'd usually have a race. And then Sunday they'd do a long run, which was 20 to 23 miles over the wide paddies, which would be the Otago equivalent of the Waiatarua's, the famous Waiatarua run. That, uh, so, you know, basically up over a mountain and down the other side in all sorts of weather. And uh, I, I got... Uh, very uh, strong and a lot of endurance, and uh, and I was running track and cross country, and uh, my times kept improving. Um, I ran the Commonwealth Games in '74 during that period, um, and in the 800 meters, and uh, ran a 2:03 to come fifth in the final of that race. Uh, and uh, all that off um, is, um, you know, running 70 miles a week with his basic marathon training. So, you know, I was doing the quintessential Lydia training. And I do believe that that's what set me up for such a long career. So, uh, you know, from running my first national championships at age 14, in my first international competition at age 16, uh, I wound it up in uh, 1996 at the Olympics in Atlanta in the marathon at age 42. So that was uh, a, basically a 28-year running career. Um, and I do believe that it was that training and that basis and strength and um, you know, just have, developing a high oxygen carrying capacity, but developing it in a, um, a systematic manner and that enabled me to just basically get, you know, strong in my musculature. And, uh, and by the time I ended up in the US running road races and jumping a marathon and, you know, on a whim just to do my long training run, um, I could run a marathon quite uh, within my capacity. And uh, um, so that gave me this uh, range of events from, um, well, I moved up basically from the 800 meters to the 1500 to the marathon and could run quite capably in all those uh, events for a long time. Tell our viewers um, about the early days um, when you first met up with your longtime rivals, uh, Alison Rowe and uh, Anne Ordain. When did you first meet up with them as a, as a teenager, was it? Anne Ordain came onto the scene. So, you know, I was uh, like a high school uh, you know, talented kid who was winning everything, and uh, and then uh, I heard of this uh, girl from Auckland who was uh, also getting that same kind of billing, and I went, "Whoa, well, you know, my, <laughs> my whole place is getting challenged here by somebody else," you know, so. Um, so we first met at the North Island Intersecondary Schools Championship. So this was the next year after uh, they had instigated this new um, uh, expanded uh, competition for high school. And so it was at Pirate Stadium in Hamilton, and we were both in the 440 yards. Um, so I don't know if we'd won heats, we probably had, I'd won mine, she'd won hers, we come into the final and, uh, you know, it was like 
we were both just so aware of each other. You know, it, it was a battle for this, you know, high school teenage and on, you know, honours. Uh, I'm a year older than Anne, so, you know, I was considered the, um, the uh, established one and she was like the up and coming one. Uh, her coach was Gordon Curry, my coach was John Davies. So there's, a, there's quite a story there. And, uh, uh, Gordon Perry was a very colourful British runner, also an Olympian. Um, and uh, so the coaches are opposite sides of the track, sort of eyeing each other and sort of sending out their judges and sort of like to see who's going to um, be the best coach and the best runner, etc. So anyway, we get on the start and um, I'm in like lane one and she's in lane eight. So, you know, we take off and we're both going around and we come to the straight and we're together. And we're like neck and neck. Um, and, you know, and we're both like tying up like crazy. You know, we've got, you know we've got the, the head up and the arms going and the legs sort of belly, you know, sort of. I'm an unglued a bit, and um, but neither of us gets given up an inch. And we cross the finish line together. In those days, they didn't have to finish. So there's a group of officials, they're all dressed in white, and they're on a tiered stand at the finish, and they're all watching the finish. And then they have a little meeting, and they decide who they saw cross the finish line first. Yeah. So they take the vote. And it, it was, it, it took quite a while, you know, we're waiting for them to, you know, make a determination about who won the race. And then the announcement comes over, finally, and Anne is announced as the winner. And so she's jumping up and down and they're all, you know, slapping each other and happy as anything. And I'm sort of like, oh, you know, um, I've got beaten. Uh, then about 10 minutes later, there's a new announcement. So the referee has disqualified Anne for running inside her lane. Oh. And uh, so she, so then they announced that she is a DNF or disqualified DQ and I'm the winner. So then I'm jumping up and down and she's doing this. So it was a really big lesson for me, you know, like how much um, our, uh, our moods, et cetera, uh, um, um, they're, they're fleeting, but they're dependent on, uh, you know, how well you do in the race. So uh, that started a rivalry that it didn't go away. I didn't think it ever went away. Um, it went... And one uh, ran her last Olympic Games in '88, and uh, so you know we're talking probably like um, '69 to '88. You know, it's a good 20 years or so um, where we were. Um, on 88, was she there in 92? No, and she was there in Barcelona, 92, yeah. So anyway, yeah, good, good 25 years probably. Um, and, and we were always keeping a score on each other. And I, I do believe, Keith, that it's really important uh, that, you know, uh, may we be blessed with good rivals because those are the ones that uh, that rivalry makes you pull from the deepest part of yourself and uh, you're always wanting to talk each other. And so, you know, you, you're doing this. And uh, so I have a, a lot of respect and, uh, and gratitude to Anne for that being such a tough and talented competitor that she was. Because, you know, she was the person that, I just loathe to have beat me, and she was the same, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, so we were lucky to have each other. 
Um, and uh, so that was Anne. Alison uh, came along a little bit later. She was also coached by Gordon Perry, so she was part of that group. Um, and I think um, Anne and Alison also had this competition because Anne, Alison came in and Alison was just a natural, you know, so uh, long, lopy, you know, a, a frame that was just, you know, beautiful to watch and, um, you know, very talented, um, uh, maybe a little more um, not as focused or gritty as Anne. Um, but, um, you know, she, 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 she just was a, a real talent. And uh, Alison and I were, were always uh, good friends, really good friends. So, um, you know, the, at the end of the race, the rivalry would be put aside. You know, when I came to the States, um, 1979 and was getting in all these road races and running them. It wasn't that long before um, Anne's, Anne came over and she started to do the road races and then Alison came over and um, and we both dabbled. There was these 10 Ks and 10 milers and you know all these races and um, I got into running the marathon fairly early. Um, Alison followed and Alison went on to do just some magnificent runs in um, Boston and New York the year that she ran uh, fantastic times and did a world best in New York City etc. Um, so the marathon pretty much became my forte. My Olympic career was one of marathon running. I ran uh, four consecutive Olympics, 84, 88, 92 and 96 in the, in the marathon. And, uh, you know, and I think uh, I, I was good at it because I could just sort of hang in there and, and finish well. So I think the marathon is pretty much all about energy management. And it's not for that type of runner who tends to be rash or they, they go hard from the beginning. Those, those type of runners um, tend to... Um, up or they're not quite so suited to the marathon um, and it was although uh, you know I still think my first love is the 800 meters mm. Mm. yeah well certainly that 800 meters you ran when you were 18 has stood the test of time in New Zealand it's still the uh, New Zealand record for that age group uh, 74 yeah it stood it's yeah. still the New Zealand record for um, under 20 women. For, for an 18 year old? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Oh, perfect. I'll check that out. Don't worry. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it just shows you, you know, how important endurance can be for even the short, fast, extended sprints, uh, how important that aerobic base can be because we, we, we know, for instance, uh, a uh, great athlete, Peter Snell, uh, broke the world record for 800 metres on grass uh, seven weeks and six days after he ran a marathon. And it wasn't mm -hmm. a very fast marathon, but he, he was with the leaders at 20 miles and then he, he ran out of energy and uh, had to sit on the side of the road for a little while, but he jogged into the finish in two hours 41. But seven weeks and six days later he rounded himself into good enough shape to um, break the world record for the 800 mm -hmm. meters and yeah. later on that year that was 1962 very early he won the new zealand cross country title by nearly 40 seconds and uh so this tremendous uh, localized endurance and in, in, in um helped him to be able to absorb, and you too, I imagine, you know, the, um, the acidic loads created by very fast and hard track repetitions to get down to your best times for 800. It's the basis of the Lydia training, isn't it? And, you know, to have a, a 
it's your bread and butter, your aerobic um, capacity is is really the main engine that is running all the time. And uh, the more that you are able to run at higher and higher speeds aerobically, the more you can serve your um, capacity to uh, run faster at the end of a race. And, uh, you know, uh, I remember when I got into marathon running and that suddenly people forgot that I'd been a track runner and you know so that there would be you know that label oh I'm a marathon runner and you know so automatically I'm going to be beaten by these faster you know you know 800 1500 meter specialists and um uh and that wasn't true you know I ran uh, the New Zealand record for the 1500 meters um, off of marathon training, basically. I think it was probably uh, 86, might have been 85 or 86, you know. So I'd done the, Olympic, the Olympics and the marathon, and I was still training big miles. Uh, but, you know, it wouldn't take too much track work, and I'd be getting pretty speedy. And, uh, you know, I went to Europe and ran 14.3 for the 1500 meters. And that was the New Zealand record at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and what yeah. about um, stepping right back down onto the track in 82 in the Brisbane Commonwealth Games? You, you'd already had a successful foray into the marathon in 1979 and 1980. 1980 was out as far as Olympics were concerned because of the boycott, which was absolutely ridiculous. But anyway, yeah. um, you got into the 1500 and 3000 at the Commonwealth Games. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you, well, you medalled in both, didn't you? Yeah, I got bronze in both. Yeah. yeah. And that was an amazing uh, time for New Zealand women because you had... Um, and, and won the 3000. From the front. And it was a yeah. hot, windy afternoon, and all the drama. And uh, she, she went from gun to tape, and out kicked uh, Wendy Sly, who's an Olympic silver medalist yeah. over three thousand meters at the next yeah. Olympics. So yes. uh, she did a tremendous run there. But you came in third, and yeah. uh, well under nine minutes, you eight fifty something. And, uh, yeah. I think that was your personal best at the time, and you'd switched down. I'd run uh, 851 at the World Championships in 81. But you, you ran an 851 at one stage. Yeah, I think it was uh, Helsinki World Championship final in 81. 83. Yeah. 83. Okay, there you go. There you go. Yeah, so then I... Okay, so it was a personal best, 8.55. And then I think I ran something like uh, 4.12 in the 1,500 metres to come third about mm. uh, five days later. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so um, just goes to show you that uh, long running doesn't make you slow. That's the whole thing. Oh, yeah, no, that's such a myth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and also, uh, fast running doesn't necessarily make you fast. No, because it's all um, you know being able to sustain a pace over a, over the duration of the race. You know, and if you can't manage that, you know, then it doesn't matter how much speed you've got. It's a factor of endurance, not speed. I'm just very very fortunate in the circumstances that I found myself in. And uh, it was really all came together in, in such a beautiful way that, you know, I lived where I did. I had my dad willing to run with me and give me that kind of input. Um, I had John Davies up the street uh, who gave me and put me on this incredible training program that was so much a part of New Zealand culture um, that I could establish uh, all the um, necessary ingredients to set me up for a career of longevity with very little injury and be able to run at a range of events. Mm. And also New Zealand, you know, 
they sent us away and on trips. And we were competing against the best before I even knew to have the good manners of some of the people I was competing against, you know. So I wasn't intimidated at all. Uh, I, I put myself in the, the international um, category very young, which I think is important. So I wasn't limited. The great Arthur Lydiard, he had an influence on your marathon performance in Barcelona, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, so Arthur was uh, visiting in the US at, uh, early on in 92. And he was staying with my friends Pris Priscilla and Dave Welch. And she's a British runner. And uh, they invited me over to dinner. I didn't even know Arthur was in town, but I went, this is pretty good. So Arthur then, you know, we're sitting at dinner and he's... Um, uh, spooning uh, the mashed potatoes in his mouth or the, the, the English way, the New Zealand way with the fork over the back, you know. And uh, and he decides to uh, give his assessment of me in the upcoming Olympics. And he says, um, so, you know, how's it going? And I said, oh, you know, I'm training really well. And uh um, he says, so uh, how do you think you can do? And I said, oh, I, I don't know. I can finish in, the, you know, I think I can finish in the top 10 or something. And he goes, oh, you can win the thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he says, and I says, well, you know, but I'm getting old because that was what, you know, everybody was saying. And even though I didn't really believe it myself, I was 37 years old and that was considered, you know, at that time, I, um, a bit over the top, I've been around too long, you know, it should be sort of out the back door by now. Um, and he just poo pooed the whole idea. And he says, listen, you've been doing my training you know, since you were 14 years old. Um, like, I've been doing his training since I was 14 years old. I mean, after, you know, like, I was one of his. Um, and he said, and you've got the experience. And so, you know, a marathoner gets better the older they are. And, uh, and he said, besides, he says the statistics are show that 90% uh, of runners at the Olympics perform below their best. So he just left it at that. And, you know, I sat there and I went, wow. So if I perform at my best, I'm only competing against 10% of the runners. And, uh, you know, the, the lights were all going on in my head. And I went, okay, so, you know, if there's like 60 people in the race. I'm only competing against six of them. And uh, so that gives me pretty good odds. Because I think I can beat most people, you know. You'd won. How many city marathons had you won? 16? Uh, yeah, I've won 16 international marathons. Uh, you know, I had the silver medal in the Commonwealth Games in Edinburgh. Um, and, yeah, I was I was pretty good at winning marathons. I have no idea where Arthur got that statistic from. And I suspect he probably made it up on the spot. <laughs> well, which I think there's probably some truth in it, you know. He's, he's a master psychologist, wasn't he? Yes, he was. He was a permission giver. He so. didn't give it lightly. So you, when he said it, it had gravitas. It was, you know, it it was solid. He he didn't say, you know, oh, you did great when you didn't do great. He gave me that. But I think in my favor, and he knew this, that when I thought of myself, I did not think of myself as being in that 90%. I thought of myself as being in that 10%. And I think that psychology that I had was probably what enabled me to uh, be a, a top competitor. 
as it turned out, you know, I I won a bronze medal on that day. I think uh, that's where really good coaching comes in because you can help just be uh, sort of tip the scale one way or the other and you know somebody and you know where they will start to sabotage themselves or do a number and you can offset it and uh, hold a space for them to fulfill something that uh, they're capable of doing but they've got to stretch to do it. So Arthur was really, uh, I think, like you said, a master psychologist and um, could work people pretty good. And I think that comes because he was so sure of himself. And you can really like, ride a lot on somebody else's surety if you, um, and especially if you trust they, they have a, uh, uh, they have a lineup of success, you know. He had that mana. He he produced champions, you know. I I would believe what he said. It's like you know when you're young and a guy has a, a blazer on with a you know insignia on his pocket, you go he must be important. So if he says something, um, I, I'm going to pay attention, and uh, which I did, and. Uh, so I think paying attention, but also being stewards for our young and seeing potential and planting seeds and, uh, you know, that's really important to have in our, um, in our society, uh, those people who can uh, say, you know, you can do it. Um, and to show them the way, you know, all you need to do is be on the path. And it's uh, it's not the well-worn path, it's, <laughs> you know, because there's many paths to destruction and, and, uh, and failure and, uh, and not using our talents in this life. And it's always there. And I do think that the path of sports is um, a fantastic opportunity because it's so honest. You you have to do it yourself. No one else can do it for you. You know, uh, you, you, you've got to earn it. And excellence is a, a path of uh, earning. And, uh, and you've got to in and struggle and uh, you know take the ups and downs and be able to ride them and uh, and to be a warrior and learn how to use this magnificent life that we have in a way that is uh, worthy. Um, so I, I'm very grateful to the path of sport. It has um, given me so much. And uh, if I can uh, pass on to people um, and the same things that the likes of Arthur Lydia and John Davies and uh, men with uh, men and blazers and, you know, all those people in, in my rivals and uh, my friends, uh, you know, if I can help young people or even old people or people who just want to know how to uh, get on that path. I, I'm I'm dedicated to doing that. It's it's what we do. We pass on to the next generation. Um, and, yeah, and that's, see, that's fantastic. That, that's worthwhile. You know, um, you know, pursuing excellence is is a very important thing to do, and it is, and it requires precision. You know, it is using the mind in a very precise way. And uh, you know, it's a it, it's a real mastery to learn how to use our mind in a way, and and to access this energy, and to um, you know use our bodies to do something that we hadn't done before, and uh, you know, um, you know, our endorphins are earned. You know, it's wonderful. 
and I'll tell you, there's nothing like an endorphin rush than coming into the stadium and knowing that you have, uh, you've earned it, you've won. Yep. You know, it's just fantastic. I remember when you came into the stadium in Barcelona, I was watching on TV, it was about four o'clock in the morning in Australia, and my, my wife Joanne was uh, asleep in bed, and I said, Joe, Joe, the rain's coming into the stadium, you know, and she she got up tired and uh, came in and watched because uh, I don't think she'd met you at that stage, but uh, anyway, she Julie watched you coming up the hill, Montjuic hill, whatever, a dirty big hill, chasing Montjuic. Yes, Montjuic is it? Montjuic. Montjuic. Okay. Yeah. And you you were. Uh, I can't remember the full details, but there was a, one particularly stubborn Russian woman there. You were either clearing out from or chasing, but you were you were hammering, and I could tell you that you're going to do something because you had a look on your face like, you know, this is mine, you know. So that was fantastic. And yeah, I, 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 yeah. So you, you you were in the zone, you know. So um, that that was really good, and uh, and then the next Olympics, I think. Uh, oh no, two Olympics after that, uh, you were staying at our place in country Victoria on the Murray River. Uh, and the women's marathon was on, and you were in our little old cottage next door, and you didn't even get up to watch. You moved on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Keith, I, um, I had a wonderful life as an athlete where I identified as an athlete. Yeah. And, uh, that was incredible, but uh, you know, it, when I retired and at the age of 41 after the Atlanta Olympics, I wanted to be a mother. Mm. And you know, I, I think Peter Snell said, you know, life is um, a necessity to you being able to reinvent yourself yeah. and you know to move on and. The um, athlete and the mother were not really that compatible, at least the way that I wanted to be a mother, like my mother was a mother. Mm. And um, so I did, I cut with it and uh, um, stopped watching races and, you know, going, oh, I could have done, I could have beat them, you know, <laughs> that sort of knee jerk reaction that gets that competitive, competitive spirit going. Yeah. Because mothering is not competitive. Mm. It is it is completely a whole different sort of psychology. And uh, and so I, I did, I, I cut from it in many ways and have gone into another phase of my life. It was a bit delayed, but I did. I got my uh, daughter at age 45. And, um, That's another and, myth, isn't it, that you, if you're a top athlete, you you're not likely to have children, but you did have a child, didn't you, at 45? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, that, that just put me on a whole other journey, which was equally wonderful and fulfilling. And, you know, now I, I sort of have a, a blend and a, of different sorts of knowledge and, you know, my daughter's left home and now... Next phase. And, uh, you know, in my next phase of life, I, I just uh, have a certain expertise that I want to pass on. Uh, and also, uh, I really want to tell people how amazing they are. And the human body and the idea that we have of it is so... Uh, watered down that we think of ourselves in a very limited way but we put to and I, I think that's it's sort of like the trick of uh, living in the matrix and um and believing our bodies to be um something that is uh, fixed and uh and that disease is something that's going to just sort of jump on us if we're not careful and that we don't have control over ourselves. And uh, 
you know, and that we better go buy something from an expert because we are deficient in some way. And uh, it's just so far from the truth. Mm. And, um, you know, our bodies are just incredible. And we have no idea of the capacity that our bodies have or even what is going on within the cell at a subconscious level. Uh, the most amazing things are happening without you even thinking about that your body is here uh, to serve you, to give you this amazing experience. And if you treat it right, it has this incredible powers of uh, regeneration, which is happening all the time. I mean, we're ge regenerating all the time. And, you know, uh, Lydia didn't say it in those terms, but uh, learning how to train correctly is like harnessing those powers of regeneration and using uh, the, the training and we can learn so much about ourselves, you know. Uh, Socrates said, know that So I'll well, leave you with that. That's Thanks. a great place to, to finish up for now, Lorraine. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Keith. Always a pleasure. Okay. <laughs>